I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer, every head bowed and every eye closed. Our Father and our God, we pray that in this period of crisis in our world, that the Holy Spirit will use it to remind us of our need of Thee and our relationship with Thee. And we pray that tonight, if our relationship is not right, that we'll make it right through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came to die on the cross because He loved us. For we ask it in His name. Amen. Tonight I want to uh, speak on a very difficult subject and one that I could talk on, I suppose, all evening before I, I wouldn't exhaust it, of course, in a long time. But I want to speak on the subject of hell. Three kinds of hell that I believe are taught in Scripture and experienced in life and eternity. But to you that are watching by television, I'd like to remind you that we're in Sacramento, California, the capital of California, if you don't know that. And uh, this is a gorgeous place that we're in. We're in the exhibition grounds of, uh, uh, well, I don't really know wh how to describe it. It looks like, uh, as far as I can see a people this way, and as far as I can see a people, not quite as far as I can see this way a people. I wish you could be here. It's a gorgeous California night, something that we don't see very much of back east of this type of weather. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the 16th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And beginning at verse 19, there's a story that Jesus told. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are in torment. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, th they would not, but if one came from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, even though one rose from the dead. Well, I'm up here tonight, not to say go to hell, but rather go to heaven. And I'm urging you not to say I'll be damned, but instead I'll be saved. And this story, the word hell is used translated hell in our authorized version, though it's actually Hades, because Hades was in two compartments, apparently. One was called paradise, and one was called the place of torment. And they could apparently see across the gulf between each other. And the word hell today is constantly used as a swear word. You hear it on television, you see it in the films, you see it in the writings of people, and you hear it at work, and you hear it in school. And I remember I was flying over the steel plants of uh, Gary, Indiana many years ago in one of the old planes and we were flying low and a man sitting beside me said, it looks like hell, doesn't it? As he saw those flames coming up in that steel mill. I remember two years ago or three, I think it was maybe longer than that, when the MGM fire took place. And uh, we went over to minister to those people because they were being brought to the center in Las Vegas where we were holding a crusade. And uh, 
I asked some of them, I said, what is it like at those top stories where the fire is? And they said, it's just like hell up there. And when Paramount Pictures had their fire here a couple of weeks ago, we were down in Los Angeles and I heard one of them say, it's like hell. The fires were raging so. And uh, I watched on television a few weeks ago the life of Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. And he was just a young man when he was appointed by General Groves to head up the Manhattan Project and develop the atomic bomb. And he'd come out of a university here in California. And uh, he looked little more than a teenager when he started. And then I remember the build-up in that film, in his life, till the moment when they set off that first atomic test bomb in New Mexico in the White Sands. And someone said, we have seen the beginning of hell. Now this is an unpopular and controversial and misunderstood subject. The United States Catholic Magazine in the May issue of this year, 1983, polled Americans and came up with the figure 86% said they believed in the existence of hell. Can you imagine that? 86% of Americans believe there's a hell. You can never understand hell, though, until first you understand the great love, mercy, and grace of God. And it should never be preached by any preacher without tears. I've heard some preachers preach on hell as though they were glad there was a hell and glad that people were going there. But I'm not. I don't like to preach on it. I do it only because I'm commanded in Scripture to preach the Word. And it's against the backdrop of God's love and mercy and grace that I must preach it. You see, hell was not made for man. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. But some have taken license in imagination and distorted the idea of future judgment. It causes some people to say that God is not a God of love. And they've distorted the biblical concept of the love of God. A lady said some time ago, I hate the very thought of hell. So do I. And I also hate the sin that sends them there. I hate war. I hate the fact that people are starving in the world. But war is a reality in Lebanon and places like that. And starvation is a reality in our world, unfortunately. My hating it does not change the facts. And hating to die doesn't change the fact that I'm going to die. And Paul wrote to Timothy and said, preach the word. And if I'm to be faithful to my calling as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I must include in that word what our Lord Jesus Christ taught on the subject of hell. One clergyman said if he used hell in the pulpit, the people would fire him. Well, I know that down in South Carolina, I came to a place some years ago in which they had 13 or I believe, no, 16 slow down signs and stop signs because so many people had been killed at that intersection. Now, is that right for the state of South Carolina to put those signs up and warn people? Is it right for me to warn you tonight? what Jesus taught and what the Bible teaches from cover to cover? Is it wrong for a man to wave a lantern to stop people at a railroad crossing? Is it wrong to wave the flag and warn of coming judgment? I remember years ago we were in Mississippi and there's a stretch of highway and there came one of those terrible tornadoes and a bridge was washed out in the gush of water and a man got out at night when he saw what had happened and he tried to wave the cars down uh, with, his, with his wet handkerchief and a flashlight and none of them would stop and five of them went over and the occupants of the cars were killed. Now Jesus cured a mentally ill person one time, the Gadarene, and a demon-possessed man and the people asked Jesus to leave them alone. And he answered their prayers. He left them alone. You don't have to listen to this sermon tonight. You can say, I don't want to hear about it. Leave me alone. And Jesus may answer your prayer and leave you alone. And if you are left alone by the Spirit of God, you can never find forgiveness of sin and you can never enter paradise. People do not want to be warned of judgment in hell. And you say, it's none of my business. Well, suppose you were a drowning man and I have the gospel lifeboat and I'm not going to let you drown if I can help it. 
You're a starving man and I have the bread of life and I'll not leave you without some bread. You're a poison man full of the poison of sin and I have Christ's gospel antidote and I will not leave you to die. I will not leave you alone. You're in the dark and lost and I have the light of the gospel and I'll not leave you alone. You're in bondage and I would speak the truth that would bring you to liberty. You're in sickness and I would speak the truth that would bring you to health. You're on a broad road that leads to destruction and I speak the truth that would get you transferred to the narrow road that leads to eternal life. You're on a wild stormy sea and I would speak the truth that would bring you to the harbor of safety. And some people say, we're not really lost. The devil said that to Eve in the Garden of Eden. When God said, you'll die, you'll die if you eat of that fruit, of that forbidden tree. The devil came and whispered in her ear through the serpent and said, you will not surely die. Now that is called universalism. In other words, everybody is saved. They just don't know it some people are saying, and we have a subtle form of universalism that's sweeping through even evangelical groups today, that will not surely die, that there's no such thing as hell. But I believe it, there is, according to the teachings of Scripture. I think it's intuitive. I think man all over the world believes that someday he's going to have to give an account and he's going to have to suffer in some way for the disobedient life that he lived here. Conscience seems to teach it. There's a little red light that goes on in the, in the soul when we do wrong. And there's a need, it seems to me, to separate the wicked from the righteous. I saw just the tail end of a little film last night called The Bunker. And it was the last days of Hitler. And I thought of all the millions of people that Hitler was responsible for destroying and killing in the most terrible ways. We have toured many of those camps like Auschwitz in, in uh and uh, Tobinka and places like that where people were, you cannot believe what you see there, how Jews and other people were murdered and killed. Now, do you think that we ought to let Hitler and people like Hitler in the same place that the saints of God are going to go? Like Augustine or Mother Teresa or any of the other famous people that really know Christ? What uh, would happen if you allowed hogs in your living room? Suppose we allowed all these people into paradise. They'd soon turn it into hell. And the fear of judgment is also needed to restrain men from sin. Suppose you took away the police force of Sacramento. What would happen? Just the fact that you have policemen. The fact that you have policemen parading up and down the highway, you don't have to stop anybody. Just the fact you see the police car, you slow down to 55 right away. <laughs> it's a discipline. And then human experience teaches it. Voltaire said, I'm taking a fearful leap into the dark when he died. And how many experiences I could tell here of just of my own knowledge of people who were screaming as they went out into eternity. And how many experiences I could tell of people who were going to heaven and the joy that was in their heart, the excitement in the room, and you were blessed by being there. And then Jesus constantly taught it. Nobody in Scripture talked about hell more than Jesus. He said, Whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He said in the 13th of Matthew, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 41, he says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And if thy right hand defend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands and to go to hell. He said it's better to go through life with just one eye, one hand, one leg than to go to hell with it all. And if you accept the teachings of Jesus, you are forced to accept that there is a place of judgment for those who reject him. Now you, you say, well, Billy, I just can't accept this, this fact. Well, you know, I got to thinking too. Suppose there's only a 10% chance that there's a hell. Is it worth taking it? 
Suppose you went out to the airport and you were going to go from here to Seattle or some such city or to Los Angeles and they said there's a, only a 10% chance that, or, or pardon me, there's a 10% chance that it won't make it. The plane won't make it. Would you get on it? I wouldn't. And yet many of us, many of us are acting as though it does not exist, that there is no judgment, there is no accountability. The man in the story we read about, whether it's literal or figurative, I'm not going to discuss that tonight, and it does not do away with its teaching. This story was the spark that touched the revolution in the life of Albert Schweitzer. He concluded that Africa was a beggar lying at Europe's doorstep, so he founded the Labrina Hospital in West Africa. And if this is a symbolic passage, then its symbols are the shadows of realities. The story tells that there's a great gulf between paradise and the place of torment. If a person lives without God, he digs a chasm between himself and those who live for God. Two men, one building for hell and one building for heaven. The Bible teaches that there are at least three kinds of hell. First, there is hell in the heart. Thousands of people here tonight have hell in your heart. And that's where it all begins. Much of the world assumes that human nature is good, but the Bible teaches that it's basically evil. By nature, we are selfish, sinful, wayward, and lost. In sin did my mother conceive me, said David. We're all sinners and we were born in sin. And then when we reach the age of accountability, maybe seven, eight, or nine, or 10 years of age, we chose to sin. Then we became sinners by practice. And we practice sin, even if we have computers. We're using computers today for fraud and all sorts of things. And then all this thing out here where the, they're looking for marijuana plants out in the forest and everywhere where people are planting them. Everywhere you look and whatever investigating committee you appoint, you turn up some snakes. Because human nature is evil. Human nature is bad. And that's the reason it needs redemption, it needs transforming, it needs the new birth. And that's what Christ came to do. Hell in the heart. There's the hell of guilt. A man who wrote me some time ago who uh, was cheating on his wife. He was living part-time with another woman in another city. And he said, I'm actually living in hell. He found himself caught. And he was hell. And the Bible teaches that there's a burning, death-dealing hell in the human heart. And the very people seem so good, wholesome, and splendid may be changed into vicious killers and maniacs overnight. I know a woman, a fine woman, beautiful woman. Her husband was one of the leaders of the community. And without hardly any provocation at all, while he was asleep, she took a pistol and shot him, killed him. She's in prison now. And we read about that every day in the paper. People, they say, that were good people, fine people, are doing all sorts of things that they never dreamed that they would be doing. So there's that in the heart, guilt. Then there's the hell of unrest. The Bible states the wicked are like the troubled sea. People this past summer, we saw in Europe, we went to Amsterdam for that great conference on itinerant evangelists, which I think was one of the greatest conferences held in the history of the Christian church. And yet we met many other people who were there just searching for something they didn't know what. I saw Americans and people from Japan and everywhere else running as though their life depended on it. They didn't know where they were going or what they were doing, they were just going. Trying to find some rest and peace. The Beatles, remember, they went to India to see if they could find something in the mystical religions of India that would bring peace to their troubled hearts. People are like an army of ants trying to escape from the destruction of their own anthill. They spend a great part of their savings trying to find some Shangri-La where there's peace. Augustine in the fourth century did this too. And he came to the conclusion that God has made us for himself and the heart of man is restless till he finds his rest in him. Man is like the troubled sea. Have you ever watched the sea how it keeps moving? And we're that way without God. In one of our cities, there's a street called Shangri-La Street, but as you enter it, there's a sign that says a dead end. There is no Shangri-La. All Shangri-Las without Christ are dead ends and lead exactly no place. 
I read about a man who went to a Pacific Island before World War II to find peace and escape the dangers of war. He thought war was building up and he was going to find peace and safety. It was Guadalcanal. And when you arrive at your Shangri-La, you may find one. When you arrive there, you're going to find your problems, your guilt, your sins will arrive with your luggage. You cannot leave it behind. But Jesus said, my peace I'll give unto you. Not as the world gives. The world cannot give you peace of heart and forgiveness of sin and take the guilt away. But Christ can. By his death on the cross, he can forgive your sins. The guilt can be washed away and his peace can be yours. Secondly, the Bible teaches that there's hell around us. Isaiah 14, 9 has a very descriptive verse and a very mysterious verse and a very interesting verse when you study it. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Hell from beneath is moved. Read it in the Living Bible, the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the whole thing. And it's an interesting passage to read. There's hell in the home. Hell in society. When a situation becomes intolerable, many people say, all hell is broken loose. If ever there was a time in human history when hell has been unleashed, it seems that it's now in our world and in the world in which you move and live. There's the hell of lust. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Someone asked me the other day what the word lust means. I'll talk a little about it tomorrow night to young people. But lust means not to just look at a woman or a man and admire them. It means that if you had the opportunity, you would commit immorality. In other words, you lust so much you would give in if you had the chance. And many people fantasize and they lust in their fantasies. The fury of sexual hell has been unleashed in our world. The commandments of God against impurity and unchastity are trampled underfoot by our generation. Our literature and entertainment are playing up sexual perversion. They're calling evil good and good evil. Isaiah said, hell from beneath is moved. It has been moved to earth. And a secular godless world revels in its lust. It rejects the gospel and takes lust. And this is the generation the Bible refers to when it says in 2 Thessalonians, And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We seem to be in a kind of demonic trend. It seems to be out of control. It seems to be something we can do nothing about. It seems that some master hypnosis who makes us behave like puppets on a string doing that which is wicked and sensual and depraved and others are living in a hell of greed the Bible teaches that as we approach the end of the age that people more and more will be taken up with greed to get what we can get now live for the now and they want instant satisfaction just like instant tea or all the instant things we see advertised on television we want instant gratification we want it now and that's one of the problems that we face in the world we see solutions on television done by a computer that quick and we think that our whole lives can be done that way that quick and then there's the hell of hatred this hell of hatred has erupted into wars and riots and all kinds of conflicts. Hell has been moved to earth. And then thirdly, and lastly, there's the hell in the future. And the future hell is a projection of the hell that you have now in your heart, in your home, in our world, except it goes on and on. Jesus spoke more about hell than any person in the Bible, as I said a moment ago, but he warned us to flee from it. It is the very fact of hell that makes the love of God so amazing and so glorious. The fact that it was made for the devil and his angels and we listen to the devil and followed the devil and we do what the devil says, and yet God loves us so much that he devised a plan to save us so that we'll never have to spend one day in hell. His grace and His mercy is so thrilling.
But for the love of God and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, every one of us would end up in hell. And hell, but hell need not be your final destination. You need not live in it upon this earth. It can be taken from your heart. It can be removed from your home, all by the grace of God. And I could tell you story after story of men and women who've come to Christ and the hell has been removed from their hearts and their lives. Now, what is the nature of hell? Well, many mysteries surrounding this subject. Essentially and basically, it is separation from God. We're separated from God by sin, and that continues out into eternity. And there are three words that Jesus used to describe hell. He used the word death. You see, God is life, and you're separated from the life of God. You're dead, spiritually dead, separated from God. And then he used the word out of darkness. God is light. We're separated from the light. So we live in darkness. And then he uses the word fire. And I've often wondered if that is a terrible fire within our hearts for God, for fellowship with God that can never be quenched. We've rejected God. We've turned our back on God. We can never know God. It indicates in this story that this man did not have a second chance. It indicates in this story that this man became very evangelistic. He wanted to reach his brothers. Think of it, he was in hell. And he wanted his brothers to be reached by somebody to go to his home and warn his brothers not to come here. Do anything but not, don't come here. And those people that have gone on before that may be suffering the pangs of hell now out in eternity would stand here tonight and warn you. Turn away. Repent of your sins. Receive Christ. Be sure of your relationship. Don't come to this place. It's the banishment from the presence of all that is joyous and good and righteous and happy. And the scripture says, prepare to meet thy God. You know, we prepare for everything except death. We prepare for education, business, careers, marriage, old age, but not for the moment of judgment. We take out every kind of insurance that we possibly can, and we worry about our old age pensions and social security and all the rest of it. But do you have assurance of your relationship with Christ? It's appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. Death is an occurrence that each man deems unnatural when related to himself, but natural when related to others. We know the other man's going to die. We know that cancer is going to hit the other person. We know that that other person may die of a heart attack or be in an automobile crash tomorrow, but not me. And we live as though we're going to live like this forever, and we're not. It'll all be over in a short time for everybody here and you'll be in eternity. Where will you be? Banished from God or with Christ in paradise? The man on the cross that was dying with Jesus was a terrible sinner. He deserved to be crucified. He deserved the punishment according to the law. And he said he deserved it. And he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he said, remember me. He didn't have time to be baptized. He didn't have time to join a church. He didn't have time to do anything except just believe. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. The first person that Jesus took into paradise with him was that thief, that murderer. That man that deserved hell. But on the cross, Christ was dying for people like him. And Christ was dying for people like you. And the hardest people to reach are not people like him. They know they're sinners. They know they need God. It's people like some of us here tonight, well-dressed. We go to church. We have a, a, a little bit of religion. But it's not first in our lives. It's not the major thing in our lives. And we have just enough religion to keep us from getting a real dose of salvation in Christ. You've been inoculated. 
and you feel that you don't have a spiritual need. What about that person that says that they're happy and got a good income, a good job, a good family, and all the rest? I don't need God. I don't need Christ. What do I need him for? You're going to need him, brother and sister. You're going to need him very badly before very long. You better come now while you have an opportunity. The Bible says now is the accepted day, time. Now is the day of salvation. Come when you can. You can't come to Christ just any time you want to. You can come only when the Holy Spirit has convicted you and drawn you and where the Word of God has been proclaimed. Have you come to Christ? You that are watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on the screen. Their counselor is standing by to talk to you right now. And if you get a busy signal, call again and again and again and again. They'll be there through the evening to talk to you and to help you. As I said in the beginning, I don't like to speak on this subject, but it's a part of the Bible, and it's an important part of the teachings of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying these things myself. I'm only passing on to you the teaching of Christ, what Jesus taught. And I do it with a broken heart. I wish there were no such thing as hell, but there is. I wish there were no such thing as sin, but there is. I wish there were no such thing as murders and wars and all that, but there is. And there is a hell. But thank God there's a heaven. There's a paradise. And that's where Jesus is. And I want to tell you tonight, I know that I'm going. The moment you read in the paper that Billy Graham is dead, you'll know that he's more alive than he's ever been before, and I'm in paradise. And I'm looking forward to it. And thousands of you here tonight can say the same thing, but other thousands cannot. You can't say it with assurance. You're not certain. Wouldn't you like to be sure when you leave here tonight that you're on your way to heaven? You're on your way to paradise with Christ? You can be sure. The Bible says, these things I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Paul said, I am persuaded that he can keep all those things I've committed unto him against that day. I know. You can know. You say, well, Billy, what would I have to do? All right, you'd have to do three things. First, you must repent of your sins. Repent means to change, change your mind, change your way of living. Let Christ come and help you change. He'll help you do the changing. You can't change by yourself. You're too weak. But if you'll say, Lord, I'm willing, he'll help you. And then the second thing is by faith receive Christ who died for you and rose again. By faith, you can't understand it all. But you come by faith and you trust and you put your total confidence in him and him alone. And then thirdly, you obey him and follow him and serve him and work for him and do all the good works that you possibly can for his sake. In his name, helping your neighbor, loving your neighbor. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love one to another. Are you willing to do that tonight?